I'm going to start off with a couple of uh, jigs. You've all heard of the Irish jig. Well, there's probably about 10,000 of them. And uh, these are uh, three or four of them, I guess. Uh, first one is called Old Joe's Jig. And the second one is called Old Tipperary. The third one is called Garrett Barry's. Garrett Barry was an old piper back in the uh, uh, 19th century. And uh, the last one is called Fraher's Jig. <clears throat> Thank you. 
you very much. <laughs> I'm imagining you're out there to be thanked. Um, <clears throat> My, uh, re th this instrument here has uh, six different reeds in it, and um, they're very sensitive to humidity or lack thereof, and um, right now they're struggling a bit, so I hope you'll excuse the, uh, the odd note. As I said, those were some jigs, and uh, I'm going to play a couple of reels for you now. And, uh, in Irish music, there's a lot of dance music. It's a good way to keep the spirits up, and uh, especially in the face of adversity. But any old time, no matter what's going on, dancing is always a good idea. And uh, so mostly in Irish dance music, there are jigs and reels. And uh, jigs are mostly in 6-8 time, and reels are in 4-4 four, four time. So these, are, these have a little bit of a different vibe to them. <coughs> More like a train. Thank you again. Uh, if you're just tuning in, uh, my name is Tim Britton, and these are the Illin Pipes, Irish bagpipes. And um, <clears throat> in case you haven't figured it out already, uh, they're pumped up with this, a bellows that's uh, strapped under my or strapped onto my right arm and um, strapped to my waist, and the air goes from there across a tube into the bag here, which acts as a reservoir for all the different pipes. And there are six pipes in this set. Uh, two of them are not uh, actually functioning at the moment, but you wouldn't miss them uh, necessarily. <clears throat> There's uh, three drones that are all playing uh, octaves of the same note. And um, the, this here is called the Chanter. It's got a double reed in the top of it, similar to an oboe reed. And uh, it plays the melody and does so in two full octaves. Normally bagpipes are limited to one octave. But this has two. And um, normally the whole idea of a bag on a bagpipe is there to give you the ability to get a constant sound uh, so that you don't have to stop 
when you take a breath. And when you've got drones going on, of course, that is uh, a whole other level of motivation to keep it all going. But um, <clears throat> uh, when you have a bag, you can attach lots of different pipes to it and all have them playing at the same time. And uh, the only problem with not being able to stop the sound is that you, uh, or rather getting the constant sound is that you can't stop it. <laughs> and um, unless you have a pad on your leg, in this case, uh, this bagpipe is unique in that regard. You can stop the end of the chanter on that and close your fingers down and get uh, what they call staccato notes. As well as getting a constant sound if you want that. Add the drones. And you have that. There's a couple of other pipes here that I won't get and won't be able to demonstrate because the reeds are not working right now, but um, they give you chords when you hit them with your wrist while you're doing the rest of it. Um, so sorry about not being able to do that tonight. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to play a very different kind of a tune now, uh, what they call a slow air. And the slow airs are basically instrumental versions of uh, tunes that would be sung, uh, and oftentimes in Gaelic, the original Irish language. And um, uh, this one is an old favorite of mine. It's actually mostly in English, but the name and a few of the words in it uh, are in Irish. And that is Astor uh, which means uh, essentially um, like dear one or love of my heart. And um, it, uh, it's a song that's sung from the point of view of someone who's being left behind in Ireland by someone who's leaving to come here to the States. And back in the uh, mid 19th century, when um, uh, thousands and thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people were coming to the States from Ireland, um, often uh, because of the famine that was happening there, which um, some people prefer to call the Irish Holocaust at the hands of the British who were taking all the food. There was actually plenty of food in Ireland at the time. It's just that um, the British were, had relegated the potato uh, to be the sole uh, source of sustenance for the Irish people and took all the rest of their food and um, fed themselves with it and left the Irish to starve. Uh, when the potato blight came two years in a row and um, <clears throat> uh, millions of people died uh, in short order and um, uh, uh, millions more came to the states and other places around the world uh, and um, to try to make a go of it elsewhere and the idea was that uh, uh, the the stories were that that there was lots of opportunity here and uh, there may have been but there was also uh, uh, opportunity to do, uh, to not Excel and not, um, you know, there was a whole era where uh, there were signs in the in the storefronts saying Irish need not apply, uh, meaning that if you were Irish, don't bother trying to get a job there. Uh, so uh, very rough times, and um, the person who's singing the song in this case is telling the person who's leaving that um, they may have heard stories of good things happening in the states, but um, they likely weren't going to be able to benefit from those and um, they should hurry back home, which of course was a very long shot in itself because most people who left never came back because um, they couldn't afford to. And uh, so they would actually hold a wake for them the night before. They called them American wakes. And uh, it was like having a funeral for your loved ones as they were leaving um, in the morning on the ships. So a storm of free, and I'll probably go into uh, something to pick it up at the end.
those last two tunes were a couple of jigs. Uh, the first is called The Hag, <clears throat> excuse me, The Hag with the Money. And the second one is called Old Hag uh, in the Kiln, The Old Hag in the Kiln, like something that you'd fire pots in, clay pots. Strange titles. Uh, there's a number of tunes with uh, that, that feature uh, in their names, hags. And that's a kind of a loose translation uh, for a word called kayach, uh, which is uh, sort of an old wise woman. Um, so uh, not the best translation, but uh, anyway. Um, I know you all want to learn to play the pipes now. And... Uh, but before you get your hopes up too far, um, what you actually typically start out on if you're interested in learning the pipes is this here. It's called a penny whistle. And thankfully, it's a lot easier to play. There are no reeds in it. And um, it's also a lot cheaper. They used to call them penny whistles. <laughs> and uh, of course, they used to cost a penny. That was when a penny was probably worth about 20 bucks uh, now, which is about what they cost nowadays. So. Um, <clears throat> this is a nice one. This costs a bit more than $20. Uh, this was written, uh, uh, made by my, my good old friend Michael Copeland. And uh, maybe he'll have a chance to watch this video. Maybe he's watching it right now. He lives outside of Philadelphia. A uh, wonderful soul and a fantastic instrument maker and musician. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to play a little tune. Um, I'm not sure I remember the name of this. In fact, I'm quite sure that I don't at this moment. But um, I'm going to play it anyway. I learned it from the, the playing of a great flute player, whistle player, and singer named Cahill McConnell, who's from Fermanagh, which is actually where my uh, family is from, uh, if you go far enough back, uh, back to the mid-19th century. And um, uh, he's a, a wonderful... Uh, person and a fabulous musician and this kind of tune I always think of him not only because I learned it from him but it kind of reminds me of him uh, it's got a very um, childlike uh, quality to it that I like a lot so much. It's such a strange sensation to be performing and feel like you're performing for lots of people then open your eyes and there's nobody there but I know you're out there. I trust it. Um, <clears throat> just gonna keep an eye on the time here. We've got just a couple more minutes before we take a little bit of a break. Um, and maybe I will, uh, let's see, I will do a song now. Um, mostly I hide behind my instruments very effectively, but occasionally I'll um, get my courage up to sing a song and use the best instrument of all, the human voice. And um, this one <clears throat> I'm going to sing now is um, called Lag and Love. It's, um, there's a lot of different subgenres within Irish music, and um, uh, 
One of them is uh, songs that are, are considered by the cognoscenti to be kind of art songs and that they were composed. They're not, they're sort of part of the tradition per se, but they're not part of the older, more folk tradition that was carried on primarily by, um, uh, in an informal setting, shall we say. And this sort of crosses that, um, the art songs tend to cross that boundary a bit, but um, but uh, they, they are still identified as somewhat separate. Um, this, uh, as I said, is called Lagan Love. Lagan is the name of a river, the River Lagan that flows through Belfast up in the north of Ireland, among other places. And um, uh, in the song, uh, it's in English, but there is one phrase that will not make any sense to you unless I tell you about it. It's uh, an uh, she, which is uh, Irish um, for a particular kind of fairy woman who would steal the hearts of the uh, artist types and um, leave them uh, forlorn and uh, aching uh, for them. And uh, in this case, the composer of the song is comparing this woman that he's fallen, uh, that he's, he's smitten by, uh, to Unlan and She. Where the lagging stream sings a lullaby, there blooms a lily fair. The twilight's gleam is in her eye, the night is on her hair. And like a lovesick lawn, she, she hath my heart and thrall. No life I own, no liberty, for love is Lord of all. Often when the beetle's horn hath lulled the eve to sleep, I steal unto her cabin warm, and through the door I peep. There on the cricket singing stone, she says the bug would fire and hums in a sad love sick. <laughs> Sorry about that. And like a lovesick lawn, she, she saves the bog wood fire and hums in a sad, sweet, 
undertone the song of heart's Tagged a couple of uh, reels on the end there. The first of was, which was one of mine called The Humors of Roxborough. Composed that while riding a bus to visit a friend of mine, Mark Simos, who composed the second tune, which he called the New Year's Resolution. His resolution at the time was that he was going to give his then wife a break from his incessant tune writing by not writing any tunes for a while. And uh, hopeless case that he was uh, immediately broke his resolution by composing that tune. I'm going to play this flute here. This is an old wooden flute. This one was made around 1841, and I had the great fortune of uh, running across this in 1976 in Ireland. Um, this is typical of the uh, what would be the normal classical uh, standard instrument um, back in the 1840s, and this one was uh, designed by kind of the, the hot young uh, uh, flute uh, star of the of the time in England, at least, a guy named Joseph Richardson, and he collaborated with uh, a great flute player named Thomas Prowse, sorry, flute maker named Thomas Prowse in London uh, to come up with this particular design. And um, I actually have a little certificate signed by both of them that was uh, in the uh, the lid of this uh, of the the case for this. And when I got it, it looked like it had been made the day before rather than 150 years earlier. Um, but um, anyway, um um, I'm probably going to play another slow air for you. And this um, particular one is called um, 
what is it called? Um, I'm blanking out right now, but um, um, I'll get to it. But what I really want to say is that I'm going to dedicate this particular tune and set of tunes to a very, very old friend of mine that I've known since I was four, I believe, or maybe three. I uh, met him at a wonderful event called Fox Hollow Folk Festival up in Petersburg, New York, right on the border of Vermont and New York and Massachusetts, right where they all meet in the corner there. And um, it was really a magical event. And uh, this man uh, was part of that magic. And he just passed on yesterday morning. Um, a wonderful, iconic figure uh, named Kevin Henry, originally from Sligo, uh, County Sligo in Ireland, and uh, settled in Chicago many, many years ago, and has been a bastion of the Irish music community in uh, Chicago ever since, which is saying a lot because there's, uh, I think Chicago is the largest community of Irish people outside of Ireland. Uh, so there's a huge Irish music community there, and. Um, he was absolutely in, at the center of it for 60 years, uh, and um, that's uh, that's pretty impressive. And 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 well, he should be. He just he he didn't seize that uh, position uh, through uh, dint of will. He simply attracted it, and that he was um, such a huge-hearted man and a wonderful musician, of course. But um, played flute. Pipes uh, was a, a wonderful storyteller, and uh, one of my favorite uh, things is hearing him do these uh, long recitations that are um, a tradition in Irish culture uh, where they might go on for 10, 15, 20 minutes even, um, all in rhythm and rhyme, and um, these extended kind of epic poems that would tell a story of something or other, and uh, he was full of them, and uh, just uh, great images of him at three in the morning, and some party after the concerts uh, and uh, him holding forth and uh, just a, a wonderful soul. So um, this goes out to Kevin Henry and um, uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> think of this, uh, the name of this tune in a minute, but um, might as well play it first. <laughs>
you. And thanks, Kevin, for inspiring us for so many years. <clears throat> um, I'm going to uh, finish up with something that's a little unusual. Um, you all uh, know the Scottish bagpipes. Well, uh, mostly, I would imagine, you know them in the context of people marching down the street, playing them in bands with drums, and it's all very militaristic, and um, uh, that's all a wonderful thing. And uh, ironically, um, that was the idea of pipe bands was all started by the British Army, and um, uh, in Queen Victoria's time, uh, she uh, became very enamored with all things Scottish, and it became fashionable to um, uh, play Scottish music and um, wear the kilt and the tartan and things like that. Now, this is uh, particularly ironic because um, it was not terribly earlier, terribly, terribly much earlier, about a hundred and some years earlier, that um, uh, the Scottish bagpipes and wearing the kilt, the tartan, all that, and the language uh, was uh, outlawed uh, at the uh, point of sword and um, by the British. So um, uh, in any case, uh, uh, prior to that time, um, the uh, main music of the bagpipe uh, in Scotland was something called pibracht, which literally just means piping, which is some indication of how dominant it was in the scene as opposed to the marches that you mostly hear these days. Um, so uh, Pibracht is a very unusual um, thing. It's uh, very slow and meditative, and um, uh, it uh, goes through a, starts with a very, very simple, uh, what they call erlar, or ground melody, uh, that uh, really sinks very deep into the notes and their, um, the way they blend with the drones, and uh, then goes through a series of progressively um, complicated uh, variations that get more and more rhythmic and um, more and more complex in their fingerings and everything and their embellishments. And um, it sort of climaxes at a certain point and then returns to that ground melody again. And I'd like to play a little bit of one. Um, <clears throat> uh, and um, I'm going to just go out with this tune. It's called Kronen the Chaylex of Enbrick. And it means uh, the lullaby of the old woman of Ben Brick. And uh, Ben Brick is a place. And uh, the old woman of Ben Brick evidently is a reference to an ancient deer goddess. Um, so it's quite an interesting thing. The, the Pibrochs uh, are prim were primarily composed uh, about uh, three to 500 years ago. And um, I get the impression from this one, and then it's a somewhat unusual one in the name and everything, that maybe it's actually uh, older than that and predates the form of Pibrocht altogether and maybe was actually sung before it was played. <clears throat> 